the largest harvest festival that we've ever had here. I'm thinking next year we're going to have to find a bigger place to do it because there were so many families and so many children. I had many people coming up to me saying, wow, this is the first time I'm here and what a warm and loving church this is. And, and so that's just great. I, I just appreciate everyone who, who stepped up and, and helped make that possible. You know, uh, a week doesn't go by when I, I just don't, you know, that I don't feel, where I don't feel like I'm desperate for God. You know, I, am, I just feel so desperate for God. Um, so many things have been happening that, that, you know, just compel me to, to have to cry out to God and need God. And I'll tell you about uh, one of those things, two of those things later on in the message. But I wanted to just open up our time in a word of prayer and just, just ask God to be here to speak to each and every one of us, okay? So will you just join, join me, uh, join our hearts together as we, as we pray? As you quiet your hearts, as you come before the Lord, maybe, maybe you had a tough week, maybe you had a difficult week, so many, so many things going on in your own personal life. You know, just take a moment to just lift all that up to God and just surrender that to God right now, will you? And then will you just pray this prayer with me as, as we did last week? Dear God, speak to me. Speak to me today. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning. We just had such a great evening last night. We're just so thankful, so grateful for what the church can be like when it is firing on all cylinders, when everyone comes together to serve. It was just so awesome, Father God. And there's a reason you put the church here. And there's a reason why you called us to be the church here in South Bay. And we just praise you and thank you for, for all those reasons and for what you're doing here. But Father, there isn't a day when we, we aren't feeling desperate for you. And I think about some of the families that are hurting and struggling and going through difficult times. I know there's so many people in this room today. You just heard some of their prayers. God, some of them had some really tough weeks, t- a tough week. Some of them really going through the ringer. Father, I pray that you would come into this room and that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit that you would fill us with your presence, that you would lift our burdens, that you would take all these concerns that we have, lift them off of us, even for this moment, God. We could focus on what it is that, that you have for us. I pray, Father, your Holy Spirit would work so powerfully to make application, help us to make application for the things that we hear today, that we might become the people you want us to be. But God, we, we surrender our lives to you. We surrender our, our struggles with you, all of the hurts and and all the things that we've been through this week, and we ask God for your help and, and divine intervention in our lives. So, Father, thank you so much. It's so good to be here. Will you bless our time together? We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, hey, good to pray, isn't it? I want to ask you to check this out. This is a, a cochineal beetle. They're found primarily in, in South America and in Mexico, and they live on the prickly pear cactus. The female beetles feed off of the, the, the cactus berries, the red cactus berries, which explains why when you squish one of these little critters, it will give off this, it will ooze this red, bright or dark red, crimson colored liquid. And someone a long time ago figured out, this is a poor bug that got squished, but someone figured out a long time ago that these, these bugs are worth a lot of money. The cochineal beetles are worth a lot of money. And so every year, down in Mexico and South America, millions of these bugs are collected, these beetles are collected, and then they're crushed. And they get out of these these poor little critters, they produce a red dye. And this red dye takes 70,000 beetles to produce one pound of dye. And then this dye is imported to the United States of America, where it is used on products like lipstick. Maybe you're wearing red lipstick today. You might, whop, you might want to wipe it off real quick. You know, there's a, there might be a handful of beetles in your stick of lipstick. It's used in juices and in candy and in, and in yogurt. I mean, does that bug you or what? It bugs me. In fact, a couple years ago, in 2012, Starbucks admitted that they used cochineal dye to color its strawberry frappuccino. So if you like strawberry frappuccino, there's probably a couple of handfuls of beetles, and they're all crushed up so that you can't tell, but just to give it a little bit of color. It's not the strawberry that gives it the color, it's the beetles that gives it the color. 
But I understand that with the uproar, the vegans went crazy and, and all the bug lovers went crazy and Starbucks discontinued this practice and they use something else now. Who knows what that is? But isn't that crazy? You know, for the last two weeks, we've been in a series here uh, called Crash. And you might remember that a crash, we learned that a crash is a group of, of rhinoceroses, they, rhinos, and they come together and they charge forward. And, and they call it, I, I suppose they call it a crash because they, these rhinos have such poor eyesight, they don't know where they're going. But when you get a 2,000 pound beast charging at you, can, anything can happen. And so we, the, the series really was about the church and how we want to be like a crash of rhinos charging forward in the future to do great things for God. And in the first week we, we talked about, we just, Pastor Greg and I just shared our dream for the church, what we want the church to be. And then last week we came back and we told you about, about why we serve in the church. And, and really the bottom line, why we serve in the church is simply because of what Jesus has done for us. Because Jesus died on a cross for us. And how can we not serve such a Savior? And that was what we talked about. Last week, we looked at Ephesians chapter 2.10. Now, you have a sheet in your bay watch. We've got all the verses listed there for you as well. I think it'd be really helpful to have one of those. If you don't have a program, you might want to lift up your hand and our ushers will get one to you. But we looked at Ephesians chapter 2.10, which tells us that we were created to serve. We were created to do good works. And I want, you to, I want to show you this verse again one more time. And it says, for we are his workmanship. And I want you to circle the word workmanship. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now last week, we, we focused on the fact that we were prepared for good works. We were prepared to do good things. We were prepared to make a difference in our lives. But, it, but today, I want to look at the word workmanship. And in the Greek, the word workmanship literally means work of art or masterpiece. It's a work of art. In other words, you were created to be a masterpiece. You are a masterpiece in God's eyes. You are a work of art. You are workmanship, and you were created as such to make a difference, to do good works. You know, recently, I learned a, I learned a shock, I, I made a shocking discovery about my daughter Natalie, who is a junior at North High School. She had been keeping this secret from me all these years, and I just found out about it a couple of months ago. I always knew that Natalie was a great uh, basketball player, takes after her dad, but, but I didn't know, I, I didn't know until just a couple of months ago that she is also a very good artist. I had no idea. She had a very good artist. One evening she said to me, Dad, hey, you want to see something I drew today? And I said, sure. And I wasn't expecting very much. But she sent this to me, texted it to me, and it was uh, her tribal design of the Hawaiian Islands. The, the island, the big island on the bottom, and then there's Oahu, and there's Maui, and there's Kauai, and you know, Molokai and Lanai, all of that. She just made a tribal design and just did that whole thing. And I thought, she sent that to me and I said, you're kidding me, right? You drew this? Are, are you serious? You drew this? Why? Well, I can't believe it. I mean, you know how to draw. I mean, I had no clue, no idea. And then she went on after, right after this, she drew a, she designed the t-shirt for the juniors uh, or the sophomores at, at, uh, at North High. It was a Ninja Turtle thing. It was just like, you drew that? I can't believe it. That's amazing. You know, the, 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 these are her masterpieces, or I think that they are a masterpiece. Well, Paul said that you are a masterpiece. He created you to be a work of art, which means that God put you together intricately and thoughtfully. And in fact, the Bible says that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Why? For the purpose of serving Christ, for the purpose of doing good works. And in order to serve him, in order, in order to serve Christ, God designed you in a very unique way. And that's what I want to talk about today. You know, in his book, Doing Church as a Team, Pastor Wayne Cordero uses the word, gets the word design, and he makes an acrostic out of it. And I want to share that acrostic with you today. And it begins with a letter D for design, D-E-S-I-G-N, but it begins with a letter D, which stands for desire. So you can write that one down. You can fill that in. The D stands for desire. And by the way, Pastor Wayne Cordero is going to be here uh, in two weeks, the weekend of November 14th and 15th. So we're really excited. He's going to come back. He was here for our grand opening, and he came for DCAT in, in our first year that we were here, but he's going to be back. If you haven't heard him, extraordinary leader, extraordinary teacher, written a bunch of books, and we just absolutely love 
uh, Wayne, and, and he's going to be here with us speaking at both services. And so uh, please invite your phones, friends. Please tell them ab- about Wayne being here. But here's the thing, and this may sound a little harsh, but it's not meant to be harsh. If you have friends and they love Pastor Wayne and they go to another church, don't invite them. All right? Don't invite them. Invite someone who doesn't know Jesus to come to church that weekend so they can hear this amazing speaker. You know, we don't want to get people from other churches to come to our church. No, we want them to stay at their church and help their church to grow. We want people who don't go to church to come to church. And, and I think they'll really enjoy hearing him speak that weekend. And then, especially because Sundays are packed, Saturday, if a bunch of you, if we can get 100 of you to move over to the Saturday night service, that'll free up a whole lot more space on Sunday morning. And, and that'll be great as well. So that's coming up November 14th and 15th. You don't want to miss it. It's going to be awesome. And of course, we're going to have our, our 24-hour prayer vigil on Friday from 6 p.m. all the way to 6 p.m. on Saturday. We're going to be praying through the night. It's so important that we pray, that we be desperate for God. So I hope you'll sign up for that as well. But God designed you. God designed you to serve Him. And it begins with a letter D in the word design. And it's desire. Desire can do funny things to you. Uh, it, it can make your heart beat a lot faster. You know, that's what happened to me when I first fell in love. Uh, you know, Cheryl was not my first love. Patsy was my first love. This is the first time I've ever talked about this publicly. Patsy was so cute, and, and she had curly brown hair. And whenever I was around her, my heart would beat faster. Desire, I want to show you a picture of Patsy. She's uh, on, the top, on, the, on the very top row. She's the fourth one from the right. That's Patsy there, and I'm the, right in the middle here, uh, the little guy in the, in the bottom row, right in the middle, that good-looking kid. I kind of look like Evan Ma, I think, right there. <laughs> we were in the third grade, and I remember I was so smitten by this little girl. I just thought she was the cutest thing in the whole wide world, and every time I got near her, my heart would beat faster, and I was thinking, what's going on, what's going on? The problem is she didn't want to have anything to do with me. And according to the Bible, our desires come from our heart comes from our heart. Psalm 37, 4 says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. His desires come from our heart. And, and your desires, your heart can make you, it can make your heart beat a little bit faster, if not literally, figuratively. You see, God has given each one of us a unique heartbeat. And it races a little faster when we encounter activities and subjects and topics and circumstances that interest us, that we are passionate about. You know, for example, I can say that, that, that all of our pastors, Pastor Greg, Pastor James, Pastor Dave, we, we have a heart. Our heart beats for the church. We love the church. Pastor Greg and I, we, our heart beats for Japan, as you know. We, our heart beats for Japan, where only a little more than 500,000 people out of 127 million know Christ. And so our heart beats for Japan. Sherry Roberts, her heart beats for Uganda, as you know. And this year, I think we're going to be, or next year, 2016, we're going to be sending a, a, the largest team we've ever had. So many of you have expressed an interest in going to Uganda. My h- wife's heart beats for Uganda, not for Japan. Lillian and Nan, their heart beats for our kids. They, they love our kids. We had, we had over 200 kids here last night, and they just love kids. Think about Laura Shishido comes to our church. Her heart beats for, for people with special needs because she has a son with special needs. So what is your heartbeat? What, what is your heart desire? What, do you, what makes your heart beat a little bit faster? Is it for, for homeless people? Is it for single people? Is it for couples with kids? Is it just with couples? Is it for abused children? Single parents? Is it for the elderly? Is it for those who have gone through divorce? Is it for those who are addicted? Is it for those who are widowed? I mean, what does your heart beat for? Does your heart beat for people who live in faraway countries like China or Russia or Myanmar or Yemen? You know, did you know that in Yemen, in, in, in Yemen there are 8 million people who live in the northern part of Yemen? And according to da- David Platt, 8 million people live in the northern part of Yemen, which is a hotbed of, of ISIS and terrorism. But out of those 8 million people, according to David, Pastor David Platt, he says only 30 of them are Christians. They've been able to figure out that only 30 people out of 8 million in northern Yemen are Christians. Does anyone here have a heart for the Yemenis? Wouldn't it be great if someone said, I have a heart for the Yemenis, and we put all the resources together and we'll send you to Yemen. Wouldn't that be awesome? They need to be reached with the gospel of Jesus Christ. The E in design, 
The D is, des is desire. The E in the word design stands for experience. You can write that one down. It stands for experience. Your life experiences are important, an important consideration in determining where and how you serve. You know, when I was a student at Belvedere Junior High School, I ran for, this was after my Patsy days, I ran for uh, student body president, and I won. And then I went to Roosevelt High School, and later on I ran for the editor of the school paper, and I won. And then I went to Pepperdine University in Malibu, and I ran for student body president there, and I won. It was amazing. It, it, since I was a little kid, as long as I can remember, I've always desired or always aspired to lead. And all of these experiences have helped to contribute to the person I am today. I love to be part of leadership. You know, and after, after Patsy crushed my heart in the third grade, I didn't date much. I, I just didn't have the heart to date much after that. I didn't, so I didn't date in the fourth grade, and I didn't date in the fifth grade, and I didn't date in the sixth grade. I did go out a few times with someone in high school, but it wasn't long and it wasn't serious. But when I went to Pepperdine University, I was the hot man on campus. Um, you know, Pastor Greg, last week talked about how he has a swagger man. I was the swagger man on campus <laughs> at Pepperdine. And, um, but, but playing the field narrowed considerably for me after I became a Christian because it was then that I decided that I wouldn't date anyone who wasn't a Christian. It just there was such a difference. I didn't, I didn't want to date someone who was a Christian. And so it narrowed. And there weren't a lot of people to date. And so after I graduated, I mean, the, narrow, the, the field narrowed even further. I didn't have very many Christian friends uh, outside of the campus. And I found a church finally. Finally started having some friends. And then my friends, my Christian friends, started getting married. And they started getting married. And I found myself every few months going to, to a wedding. And many times they would say, well, Gary, I want you to be my, be my groomsman. I want you to be my best man. And I would, I would go to these weddings. And the older I got, the more I hated going to the weddings. Do you know why? Because when it came to do the garter toss, the MC would get up there and say, okay, where's Gary Shuhama? We're doing the garter toss. We know he's single. Get him up here. And, and it would kill me. I didn't want to have the sh spotlight shine on me because I was a single guy. Every wedding, hey, where's Gary Shuham? And, and so as soon as I knew the garter toss was coming, I'd leave because it just hurt like crazy. It really did. In fact, people would come up to me, when do you get married? When do you get married? I, you know, it hurt. It hurt so deeply. And all these painful experiences have helped to, to forge the person that I am today. God has used the painful experiences that I've had to shape me into who I am. And I, and I think one thing, I think it's made me a lot more compassionate. I think I've a lot, become a lot more compassionate than I, than I would have otherwise. You see, believe it or not, your experiences will play a factor in, in, in your design and how you serve him. You know, in the Bible, the Apostle Paul experienced enormous hardship and pain. Take a look at 2 Corinthians 11, verse 23. We looked at this before, but I think it's just worth looking at one more time. Let me read it to you. Paul wrote, I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. Whew. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have gone, often gone without food. I've been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches." I mean, you can start right there. He, he was just put through the ringer. I mean, he, it was just a meat grinder. It was pulverized, I mean, be, beaten and battered. I mean, he just went through it all. And then here's the clincher. Here's the clincher, verse 29. At the end of it all, he says, For who is weak, and I do not feel weak? Who is led in a sin, and I do not inwardly burn? And here's what Paul was saying. Because of what you've been through, because of what I've been through, I could relate to what you're going through. If you are weak, I've been there. I can relate to you because I've been weak. If you sinned and you know the sting of sin, I, I can relate. I understand because I have sinned as well. 
And see, Paul was saying that his experiences, even the difficult ones, made him a more effective servant because he could relate to people because of what he had experienced himself. Years ago, I was, I was driving home from work at City Hall, and just as I was getting close to, to the house, there's a high school right around the block from where I lived, and I saw this police activity, a lot of sheriff, sheriff cars out there, and the, the lights were flashing, and, and I drove by, and, and right in front of the school, there was a young man, a teenager, with a gun, and he had it pointed to his stomach. I'll never forget this, and I, just as I drove by, I slowed down, and I looked at him, and he looked at me, and we locked eyes with one another, and I just, my heart just went out to him, and the, and the sheriff's deputies were there trying to talk him out of, of, out of killing himself, and then I just drove by, and then I went to my house, and pulled in the garage, and went into the house, and, and my heart was just burden for him. So I started praying. I just was praying that, that he wouldn't do this. Um, shortly after that, I heard the gunshot go off, and my heart just sank. It, it, it sank, and, and the next day I called the sheriff's department and just wanted to know what happened to the young man. And the sheriff's officer said, you'll never believe it. It was a miracle, but he survived, and he's alive. And we don't know how, but he's alive. And so, so I asked for his name. I asked what hospital he was in. The officer gave it to me. And so I decided to go see him. And before I went to see him, I decided I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take him a Bible. So I went to the bookstore and bought him a Bible. And, and then I went to the hospital, looked up his name, and went to his room. And the moment I walked in, he said to me, I know you. And I said, I know you. And he said, I know you because... You drove by that day, didn't you? And, and I saw you drive by, and I go, yeah, you remember that? And I go, and then he told me that he had been thinking ever since he shot himself, um, that he'd been thinking a lot about God. Well, that day he gave his heart to Christ. You know, what a, what a great story. But I, as I think about that, I, I would have never, had I, not, had I not had the experiences that I had had, and I've never tried to kill myself, but I've experienced depression. I know what it's like to feel despair. Um, if I hadn't gone through what I'd gone through, I don't know that I would have reached out to him. I don't know that I would have, have had any compassion for him. You see, our experiences play a role in, in, in how God designed us and what we would do with our lives. And so, same is true for you. If it, you don't have painful experiences, you can't do what you do. I mean, the fact is it determines our design. For example, if, if you have struggled with alcoholism, if you've overcome alcoholism, and you find out about, about somebody here in our church and they're struggling with alcoholism or some other kind of addiction, well, you are in a great place to be able to go and minister to that person and say to them, hey, man, I've been there, I've done that, I've struggled with it, you can beat this. You know, with God's help, you can overcome this. Or maybe you've had an abortion, and you hear about a young lady in our church and she's thinking about having an abortion or, or you, you meet somebody who's had an abortion and she's struggling with the guilt and pain of it all. You're in a position to be able to tell her about the love and the grace and the mercy of God and, and of Jesus, that if you turn to him, he will forgive you even, even of having had an abortion. Maybe you spent some time in prison or jail and you find out that somebody here is in prison or jail and you're in a position to be able to minister to them because you've been there and you've done that. Or maybe you've lost a loved one, which happens a lot because everybody dies. Maybe you lost a child and you find out that somebody else has just lost a child. You're, God has put you in a position to design you in such a way that because you've been through it, you can go to that person and just wrap your loving arms around them, encourage them, and pray for them. See, our experiences factor into the design. The S in the word design stands for spiritual gifts. So D, desire, E, experiences. The S stands for spiritual gifts. You know, every person who becomes a Christian, everyone who becomes a Christ follower is given a spiritual gift. Did you know that? If you're a Christian today, if you become a Christian, God has given you a spiritual gift with, which you can use to serve the Lord. So write that, write that down, spiritual gift. Right, and you can write this one down as well. I've been given a spiritual gift to serve Christ. You've been given a spiritual gift to serve Christ. 1 Peter 4.10 says, As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Circle the word gift. 
And then underline, serve one another. And then tie the gift and the serve one another together. Just put a line to connect them together. You've been given a gift, a spiritual gift, with which to serve others. See, the gift, notice, the gift that has been given to you is not for you. The gift that God has given to you is for somebody else, that you would use that gift to serve somebody else. And by the way, all the spiritual gifts can be found in 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12, Ephesians 4, and 1 Peter chapter 4. And this Wednesday evening, this Wednesday evening at 7 p.m. from 7 to 9, Pastor Greg and I are going to teach a two-hour class here called Crash Course. And during this class, we're going to get, and we're going to do this for the next three weeks starting this Wednesday. But we're going to, this Wednesday, we're going to get really specific about your design. We're going to talk, we're going to give you some exercises that might help you to discover what your heart is, what your desires are. We're going to give you some exercises to help you to reflect on your experiences, what you've been through. And then we're going to also talk about your spiritual gifts. We're going to get a, into a lot of detail here over some of the gifts. We'll tell you about what the gifts are. And so please don't miss it. Please come to Crash Course this, this coming Wednesday at 7 p.m. And there's a flyer in your Baywatch. You can just fill that in and let us know that you're going to be able to come uh, and, and just, put that, just put that in the offering basket a little bit later. Second, second thing, I want you to write this one down. I can't choose my gift. The Holy Spirit does. I can't choose my gift. The Holy Spirit does. 1 Corinthians 12, 11, Paul said, All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. In other words, you don't get the gift that you want. You get the gift that God decides to give you. Your job is just to figure out what gift he gave you. You can't say, oh, I want that gift. Oh, I want this gift. Oh, I want, you know, this is the gift. No, no, you just, whatever gift God gives you, that's your gift. You have to figure out what that gift is. Third, write this one down. I have at least one spiritual gift. I have at least one spiritual gift. 1 Corinthians 7, 7 says, I wish that all were as I myself am, but each has his own gift from God, one of one kind and one of another. Now, it's possible. Everyone, everyone gets one spiritual gift with which they can use to serve the Lord. It's possible you can have two gifts or three gifts. I, I believe I have two gifts. My top gift is teaching. My second gift is leadership. And so I can use these gifts now to serve the church. And now imagine if you have a gift and you don't serve the church, right? If I decide that I'm going to come up here and, and do something else other than teach, then, then the church is going to be in a bad way, right? So, so you all have a gift. You got to figure out what that, what that gift is. The fourth one, I must not neglect my gift. I must not neglect my gift. First Timothy 4.14 says, do not neglect the gift you have. Do not neglect the gift you have. Circle the word neglect. The worst thing that you can do is not know what your gift is. Actually, what's even worse than that is to know what your gift is and you don't do anything about it. To know what your gift is and you don't use your gift is a total waste of your life. So I would ask you, do you know what your spiritual gift is? Do you know what it is? You have a gift. You have at least one gift that God has given you. Do you know what it is? Once you know what it is, then you start using that gift to serve the Lord. The I, number four, the I in design, the word design stands for individual personality. Individual personality, God designed everyone with a unique personality. It plays a role in how you serve. Now, there are basically two types of personalities. There are introverts and there are extroverts, right? Introverts and extroverts. And you probably have a pretty good idea whether you're an introvert or extrovert. At least you should. Uh, if you don't know whether you're an introvert or an extrovert, then I want to, let me give you just for our purposes today, by the way, you can, you can get into a whole lot of detail. I mean, these introverts and extroverts, they're all kinds of introverts. They're all kinds of extroverts. And we're going to get into that on Wednesday night. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, so don't miss it. But we'll get into that a lot deeper. But just for our purposes today, there are two kinds, introverts and extroverts. And the question is, which are you? And if you're not sure, then let me give you a quick little quiz, a short little quiz to help you determine whether you're an introvert or an extrovert. All you need to do is just write down um, some, some letters here, A, B, or C. Okay, Number, the first question is this. First question on the survey is this. I enjoy being the center of attention. All right, is that you? Do you enjoy being the center of attention? A, most of the time, if that's you, just write A on your sheet. B, sometimes, or C, no, I dislike being, I dislike being the center of attention. Okay, which are you? Are you A, B, or C? Do you like being the center of attention? Do you not like it? Sometimes it's okay. All right, no, question number two. Being around other people makes me feel energized. Is that true? Is it A, I feel inspired and motivated around others? If that's you, then write down A. 
be somewhat, but I also enjoy having time to myself. Or C, no, I find interacting with lots of people exhausting and draining. All right, if that's you, then write down C. Number three, when given a choice between working as part of a team or working as a group, I prefer to A, work with as many people as possible, B, work as, as part of a small group, or C, work by myself, which is you. W which would you rather do? Work with people, work you know, with a small group, work with nobody. Number four, I enjoy solitude. No, I just like being alone. Is that you? A, you like, just like being alone. B, somewhat, I don't mind spending time alone, but I also need to get out and socialize. Or C, yes, a great deal. I love solitude a great deal. Is that you? A, B, or C. Number five, social gatherings. Just a couple more. Social gatherings. I tend to A, talk to as many people as I can. B, spend time with a few people that I know. Or C, keep to myself. Number six, when talking to other people, I typically A, speak spontaneously without thinking first. B, speak freely but monitor what I say to some degree. C, plan out what I plan to say carefully before speaking, which is you, A, B, or C. Number seven, there's one, two more. I enjoy meeting new people. Is that you? You enjoy meeting new people? Yes, A, yes, I'm always making new friends. B, sometimes, depending on my mood. Or C, not at all. I don't enjoy meeting new people. I prefer to socialize with a small group of close friends. And finally, number eight, other people might describe me as difficult to get to know. Is that true? Other people describe you as difficult to get to know. A, no, I love sharing my thoughts and feelings with others. B, somewhat, but I open up to people after getting to know them. Or C, yes, I'm reserved and a private person. Okay, which are you, A, B, or C? All right, tally up your answers. How many A's do you have? All right, tally up the number of A's. How many B's do you have? And how many C's do you have? All right, if, if most of your answers are A, then you are an extrovert, right? If most of your answers are C, then you're an introvert. If most of your answers are B, then you're both an introvert and an extrovert. You got a little bit of both, okay? How many extroverts in the room? Extroverts. We got a couple of extroverts that will stand up and start dancing around and singing all. want to come up on this stage. They're thinking, I want to get up on that stage. I want to get up on that stage. How many of you are introverts? We're really just a few... They're, the introverts don't even want to raise their hand like, <laughs> right? How many of you are both? A, B, and uh, B, right? Most of you are, that's good, right? So you got a little bit introvert, got a little bit extrovert. All right, take a look at this photo. Who's the extrovert in this photo? <laughs> Hint. He's wearing a red sweater, right? It's very easy to spot the, 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 the extroverts because they just love people and they just kind of go crazy, Right? It, you know, it's impossible. Let me just say, it's impossible to nail down your personality with this very unscientific, very short eight quiz survey. It's just impossible to do that. So we'll get into it a whole lot more on Wednesday. We're going to really delve into it. And it'll be a lot of fun, so, so please come. But, but in the Bible, we can see how personalities uh, affected how certain characters interacted with each other and, and how they even did ministry. For example, it's clear that the Apostle Peter was a, a type A personality. He was an extrovert to the max. I mean, he was impulsive. He was brash. He was hard-charging. When, when the soldiers and the high priests came to arrest Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, Peter was there with him, and it was Peter who said something to the effect, Don't you dare take Jesus! And he pulled out his sword, and he slashed off the ear of the priest's high servant. Of course, Jesus said, wait, 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 and he got to pick up the guy's ear and he put it back on his head. That, but that was Peter. He was just this type A personality. On another occasion, in another story, Peter and the disciples are out on the boat on the Sea of Galilee, been fishing all night. I've done that. They fish all night and they, they didn't catch a thing. Finally, it's daybreak. It's daybreak and they, they see this man standing on the shore. It said, the Bible says they're about 100 yards offshore. And he sees this man, and once Peter realizes that the man that they see on shore is Jesus, the gospel tells us, John 20, 21, 7 tells us that he just jumped out of the, the boat and headed for shore. In fact, if you, if you take a look at John 21, 7, it says, When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer, outer, outer garment, for he was stripped for work, and threw himself into the sea. I mean, he just threw himself into the sea. He didn't slip out of the boat and just, just jump. He just threw. And you know what it says in verse 8? The rest of them all rode back to shore. But Peter, oh no, there's Jesus, there's Jesus, that's where I'm going. I, forget you guys, I'm not going to wait for you, I'm just going. And because he was that hard-charging type personality. Someone who was the opposite of Peter, 
was his brother Andrew. Andrew wasn't impulsive. He wasn't hard charging. He was an introvert, right? He was the one. He's like you barely want to raise his hand. When actually Andrew found Jesus before Peter did, and when Andrew found Jesus in John 1:42, it says, you know what it says? It says he brought him to Jesus. Notice that he brought him to Jesus. Andrew brought his brother to Jesus. Andrew didn't do a Bible study with his brother. He didn't preach a sermon to Peter. He didn't drag him and tell him all these. No, he just said, he just brought him to Jesus. And, and, and he said, Peter, Jesus. Jesus, Peter. And that was it. He, some of you are like that, right? Some of you are introverts. And you're not going to ever get, stand in front of a big crowd and preach a sermon like Peter did to 3,000 people on the day of Pentecost. You're going to just say, hey, come to our church. Just come to our church. Just come to our church. That's it. Right? You're not going to do, big old, do this big old sermon. Just simply invite. And that's good because that's how God designed you to serve him. You know, in terms of application, if you're an introvert, uh, the greeting ministry may not be for you. Right? Because you're going to stand there at the, the, the entrance to our church and you might be like Eeyore. Like, Hello. Welcome to South Bay Community Church. Oh no, here come more people. <laughs> but we want you to be like Tigger, right? Bouncy, bouncy, bouncy. Oh, here come more people. Come on in, everybody. Welcome to South Bay Community Church. It's so good to have you here, right? Or if you've got a little bit of both, you're introvert and extrovert, even better. We'll put you out there because some people can be over the top, right? Too bouncy, bouncy. Well, calm down, calm down. But if, and that's most of you, right? You, all of you ought to be greeters in our church because you got a little bit of both. You're not too over the top, but then you're really friendly. I had so many people come up to me last night and say, you know what, it's my first time here. Everyone is so friendly. That's good. We want to hear that, right? We want to hear that. So many other practical applications, but your individual personality fits into your design and it determines how you will serve. You know, the, the G in design, the G in design, stands for growth phase. It stands for growth phase. You know, after I became a Christian at Pepperdine, I couldn't believe it. I was actually invited to go on a one-year mission trip to Japan. And even back there, then, back then as a 21-year-old, I had a heart for Japan. I'd never been to Japan in my life, but I just thought, oh, I got to go to Japan. I want to go to Japan. I want to go to work. I want to go work at this church in Ibaraki. I remember Ibaraki Prefecture. I want to go there. But then I thought, but what do I know? I just became a Christian. I mean, I, I barely read the Bible. I didn't have a consistent prayer life. I didn't, no one ever sat down and told me how to do devotions. I, mean, I didn't know how to lead someone to Jesus Christ, tell somebody about Jesus. I, I hadn't, didn't know anything about these things. I knew nothing about ministry. But there was just tugging in my heart, oh, you ought to go, you ought to go. And people said, oh, yeah, you ought to go, you ought to go. you would be really good for you. And I said, and finally I said, no, I can't. I don't know anything. And so I, at the end of the day, I didn't go, and I'm just so, I'm so thankful I didn't. I think if I had gone to Japan when I was a Christian for only a couple of months, I think it would have been disastrous for them and for me, for my faith. You know, the growth phase of your design has to do with where you're at spiritually and where you're at emotionally. Where you're at spiritually and where you're at even emotionally is critical with regards to, to your serving. If you're a brand new Christian, if you're brand new to the faith, I wouldn't recommend that you go to Yemen you know, and, and, and try to work with the Yemenis where there are only 30 Christians among 8 million people, probably not a good idea. And I wouldn't recommend that you lead a ministry or lead a Bible study. I mean, you, you just become a Christian, now you're leading a Bible study? How does that work? You don't even, you've not even read the Bible, right? You shouldn't be planning a church. So many other things like that. If you're, if you're hurting or you're grieving or you're just, you're angry, you've got some personal issues that have been coming up in your lives. Maybe this is the time to just pull back and take some time to grow in your faith and, and, and heal before you jump right in. You need to take baby steps. You know, when Paul was converted to Christ, he didn't begin preaching his, his preaching ministry the very next day. He was a great preacher, wrote half of the New Testament. He didn't do all that right away. Galatians 1.17, the next verse, tells us that he went away to a desert in Arabia for three years and that's where he prepared himself to serve Christ. You know, the good news in our church is that most of the ministry opportunities you see on that ministry's opportunities list, most of the opportunities there 
are suitable for new believers as well as mature believers. I mean, you can jump in just about anywhere uh, unless it's a leadership role. And when you serve Christ, you've got to consider your growth phase. Where are you at spiritually? And where are you at even emotionally? Finally, the N in design stands for natural abilities. Natural abilities, write that in, D-E-S-I-G-N. And according to the Bible, the chief artistic designer for the tabernacle of God was a man named Bezalel. His name was Bezalel. The tabernacle, by the way, by the way was the portable dwelling place of God uh, in the desert during the time of the Exodus, the Jewish Exodus. Exodus 35, 30 says this, Then Moses said to the people of Israel, See, the Lord is called, has called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, son of Ur, of the tribe of Judah. And he has filled him with the Spirit of God, with skill, with intelligence, with knowledge, and with all craftsmanship, to devise artistic designs, to work in gold and silver and bronze, and cutting stones for setting and in carving wood for work in every skilled craft. In other words, God gave Bezalel these natural abilities to design and to carve and to work with his hands and to work with, with precious metals and to create works of, of art that glorified God. Well, in the same way, God has given you natural abilities to do the very same thing, to serve Him. And our natural abilities don't, are not to be confused with our spiritual gifts. They do completely different things. For example, you may be a good cook or a baker or, or a cotton candy maker. Uh, last night, uh, Alan Hamada was out there making shaved ice for a whole bunch of people. Right? That's an ability. That's a talent. That's not a spiritual gift. And you can use your abilities to serve the Lord. You might, have, you might have the ability, to, a talent to sing or to play an instrument. Some of you, a lot of you don't have that. You don't want to get up here to sing like me. You don't want to do that. But believe it or not, leading worship is not a spiritual gift. Did you know that? It's not a spiritual, oh, I have the spiritual gift of leading worship. No, it's not a spiritual gift in the Bible. But it is a talent or an ability that God has given you. And if you have these abilities, you want to use them to serve the Lord. Maybe you're good with a camera. Taking pictures is not a spiritual gift, but it is an ability, a talent, and you can serve the Lord. You can be on our South Bay paparazzi team. They were here last night taking pictures of everybody who wanted, who wanted their picture taken as a group. Uh, Darren Ogamori leads that ministry with a bunch of you. He said that we took more pictures last night at that harvest test than we ever have in our entire history. Twice as many pictures last night. And that's awesome. And, and he said, and we just give them out. Here, here's your family picture. Here's your picture. Here's your picture. He said, people were so blessed. He said, they wanted to pay for it. No, 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 no. This is just our gift to you. We just, and that's a ministry. God uses your talent. If you're a photographer, join our In Focus ministry. It's awesome. Or maybe you like to dance. Or maybe you like to act. Or maybe you're good with your hands, or maybe you like to make crafts, or maybe you can paint or draw. Maybe you have a knack for technical things or an ear for sound. These are all natural abilities that God has given to you that you might serve Him. And so again, at our crash course this Wednesday night, we're going to explore your natural abilities, help you figure out how God designed you. So here it is again. Let's just kind of review. You've been designed by God to serve Him. The D stands for desire. The E for experience. The S for spiritual gifts the I for individual personality, the G for growth phase, and the N for natural abilities. And when you serve God according to your design, you will experience maximum effectiveness and joy. But if you serve Him, if you serve Him, if your service is not in accordance with how God designed you, it will eventually lead to frustration and ineffectiveness, kind of like the rabbit, the penguin, the squirrel, and the eagle. The rabbit, the penguin, the squirrel, and the eagle. They wanted to make a difference in this world. And so they decided to go to school and to get educated. And they had, as, as their curriculum included running and climbing and swimming and flying. The rabbit's first class was running. He loved to run. He was, the top of the, he was at the top of the class. The rabbit was really fast. The rabbit said, I love school because I love to run. But the penguin hated to run. Penguin didn't run very well, and the squirrel didn't run very well as e either, and neither did the eagle. And the instructor said to the penguin, the squirrel, and the eagle, what's wrong with you? Why can't you run like the rabbit? Well, the rabbit's next class, second class, was swimming. And when he saw the water, he says, I hate water. I hate to swim. And the instructor says, no, you're swimming. He kicked the rabbit into the pool, and he almost drowned. When the squirrel saw the water, he says, I ain't going in. I hate water too. And so did, and the eagle said the same thing. 
But the penguin saw the water, and he dove right in. He loved the water. He swam like a fish. And the instructor said to the rabbit, the squirrel, and the eagle, what's wrong with you guys? Why can't you swim like the penguin? And the rabbit, his next class was climbing. And no matter how, high he, how, hard, how hard he tried, he just couldn't get up that tree. And the eagle couldn't get up the tree either, and neither could the penguin. But climbing the tree, piece of cake for the squirrel. Squirrel saw the tree, and he just scurried right up that tree. He said, I love this class. I love climbing. But the others hated it. And the instructor said to the rabbit, the penguin, the eagle, what's wrong with you guys? Why can't you climb like the squirrel? And finally, the rabbit's last class was flying. And the rabbit, no matter how hard he flapped his rabbit feet, couldn't get any lift. Neither could the penguin. Penguin can't fly. And neither could the squirrel. They flew, in, flew nowhere fast. But when the eagle flapped his wings, he soared like an eagle. And he said, I love this class. I love to fly. Wow, look at him fly. And then the instructor said to the rabbit, the penguin, and the squirrel, I don't understand. Why can't you fly like the eagle? Why? Because that's not how God made them. Right? That's not how he made them. God made the rabbit, the penguin, the squirrel, and the eagle. He made them all different. He made them to do what only they can do, and he made them to do what others cannot do. In the same way, God made you special. He made you to do what others cannot do. He made you to do something unique and something special to serve him. The only thing that God made all of us to do is serve him. What you have to figure out is how God made you to serve him. And when we serve him in accordance with how he designed us, you will run like the rabbit, you will climb like the squirrel, you will swim like the penguin, and you will fly like an eagle. You've just got to figure out how God designed you. One last thing. On Thursday, Pastor Gray got a call from a young lady who attends our church, been attending for just a few months. She comes with her husband, Jeremy. And she called on Thursday, was really uh, pretty distraught and uh, in tears as uh, she spoke to Pastor Greg. And she says on Monday, she says, my husband, Jeremy, who's only 33, was diagnosed with a very rare form of leukemia. And he's, uh, he's on a respirator. He's on life support. This was Thursday. And I don't know what to do. So I thought I'd call the church. And Pastor Greg took the call, prayed for her, and, and said, told her that we wanted to come down and, and pray for Jeremy. And so she finally said, she called back Friday, said, would you come Friday? So two days ago, Pastor Greg and I went over to the hospital, to ICU, to pray for Jeremy. And it, it was just really heartbreaking. He's, he's on a respirator. He is, he's so sick. And he is desperately in need of our prayers. And we told Juliet that we would, we would tell you all about it and that we would, we would pray, um, that you would pray for him. And yesterday... Um, Pastor Gray got another call saying that his condition had worsened. And so he went down again yesterday. And when Pastor Greg told him that we were going to be praying for him, she, she just said to him, Jeremy, 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 the church is going to be praying for us. Everyone's going to be praying for you. Every, a whole lot of people are going to be praying for you. Okay, you've got to fight. You've got you gotta, you gotta to beat this thing. And as we chatted in the car on the way back from the hospital, Pastor Greg and I thought, this is why we serve. N not just him and me, but this is why we all must serve. This is why the church has got to do what it does so well so that we can be there for people who are hurting, for we, so we can be there for people who, and pray for them when they are sick, so that we can be there to point people no matter who they are, young or old, white or black, yellow or red, that we can point them to Jesus. I mean, this is why we do what we do, so that you and I can be the hands and feet of Jesus. That's why we serve. That's why it's so critical that you use the gift that God has given you to serve him, so that we can be there for other people. I thought about all those people who came last night to our Harvest Fest. And I thought about all of our servants, all of you who brought candy, 
All of you brought cases of water. All of you who've been praying, all of you who've just served in one of the game booths, all the ones of you who served the tacos and the rice last night to our guests, you didn't just bring candy. You didn't just serve rice and tacos. You didn't just bring a case of water. No, you didn't just help out with the children's ministry or ITM or whatever. No, you know what you did? You touched a person's heart so that they can hear about Jesus. You touched a child's heart. So maybe they'll say to their mom and dad, I, I want to go back to that church. Can we go back to that church on Sunday? So they'll come and they'll hear about Jesus in their kids' group class. And mom and dad will come to the main worship center and hear about Jesus here. That's why we do what we do. Jeremy and Juliet is why we, we must do what we do. This week, you know, we lost another really dear friend of ours. Some of, some of you know him, Michael Silva. He used to come to our church. He was part of our, part of our drama team. Just the, the kindest, nicest, funniest guy you will ever meet. And this week we heard that he was tragically taken. And, you know, our hearts just break. And, but this is why we do what we do. And so I hope that you will prayerfully consider serving. And if it's not at this church, that's okay. Go to a Bible teaching church, a Bible believing church. Find out what your gift is and serve him there. But serve him. You know, if something so small and insignificant as a beetle has a purpose, how much more do you? God created you to be a workmanship, a, a masterpiece. Don't neglect the gift that God has given you. Serve him and make a difference. Let's close our time in prayer. Father, as we close our time today, my my thoughts, my heart keep going back to the moment when I first learned that Michael was gone. Goes back to that hospital room where Jeremy is laying, fighting for his life, 33 years old. Father, I think about Tammy Sasha, whose service will be held later on this afternoon here, and how broken her husband and her sons are. And I think about all the things that went on last night, and I'm just reminded that this is why we do what we do. And I pray, Father, that South Bay Community Church will never be a church of four ministers, but I pray that South Bay Community Church will be a church of 700 ministers, hundreds of people, because we have come to the realization of what you have done for us, that you died on a cross for our sins, Jesus, that you were raised from the dead and that you've given us your Holy Spirit and you've given us a gift. You've made us a, work, you've made us a masterpiece to serve you. Oh, Father, may, I, may every heart, may every life in this room be so taken by you that we cannot help but serve you. Father, will you speak to every person here right now lead and guide and direct them to discover their design. Bring them out Wednesday night. Let them fill up that flyer on our, on our ministry needs so we can reach more people, so we can touch more people, so that we can be the hands and feet of Jesus. So thank you, Father. We love you. We love the church. Help us to be the people you want us to be now. In Jesus' name.